These four words are important because they tell us all about our architectural response to the conditions of the industrial age we have been living in. These words do not mean the same thing, but they are all related to each other, nesting in each other from modernist on up through to modernity. This presentation was originally delivered to an audience at the American Center in Ho Chi Minh City on 14 October, 2020. It is the first part of a three-part series presenting modernism and contemporary architecture in Vietnam. The focus on modernity and modernism in this presentation provides the context for the following two presentations. All right. Well, thank you very much to the American Center for inviting me uh, to do this series of presentations uh, today on modernist architecture. And thank you all for coming out here in the rain to uh, show your interest in modernist architecture. And also to you folks out there on the camera I can see up there on Facebook. Uh, thank you also for your interest in modernist architecture. So today we're going to focus on trying to make sense of four words that all have the word modern in them. So they're all related words, so they, uh, uh, they're similar, but they're very different. Now, I'm educated in Western history and thought, so I'm, I don't know as much about Eastern thought as I wish I did, but uh, I'm gonna have to go with what I know, of course. So most of what you're going to see today uh, really deals with uh, Western history. Now, these four words, modernity, modernism, modern and modernist uh, all deal, they all come out of the in industrial age of history. So first we have to look to see what does the industrial age mean? How does it fit into the history of civilization? And part of doing that, we'll also learn about classicism. Classicism is the styles of architecture that preceded modernist architecture. So we need to be able to compare them. Uh, you'll understand both of those isms uh, better if you see them both hand in hand together. Okay, now this is a simple chart. It's a simple approach to the ages of history. Uh, the real historians uh, look at much more detailed periods of history than this, but this is a simple approach that works pretty good uh, for arts and architecture. Now you see here three basic ages, the agricultural age in the top, the red bar, the industrial age in the middle there, the, the uh, blue bar, and then down here in the lower right-hand corner, the little green bar there, uh, the information age that uh, I think we're heading into now. So the, each of these ages began with critical events of history, but they tend to end when the next period of history just overwhelms them. Each of these periods of history has a different way of thinking and really a different sense of reality. Now, his, uh, history, or the recorded history, began with the agricultural age when uh, people, ancient people uh, decided to settle down and uh, figured out how to grow crops and they were tending animals. That was the beginning of both recorded history as well as the agricultural age. So you can see in that red bar, the agricultural age continues, even though most people aren't uh, no longer thinking in the way of the agricultural age, but uh, a lot of people are. I mean, consider Vietnam as an example. Uh, about half of the economy, as I recall, is, about, is in agriculture, about 50%. Uh, but of course, a lot of it's now industrialized, shrimp farms, uh, fish farms, but nevertheless, a good portion of the population here in Vietnam is uh, still thinking in the agricultural age. And uh, a marker for that, for their way of thinking, is time. Uh, time uh, to people in the agricultural age was circular. Year after year of planting and harvesting. Um, and they used the lunar calendar as a result. Now, if you're growing crops, 
you're subject to uh, the natural forces, weather. You're looking for the rain to come at the right time, and then you're hoping the rain won't come at the harvest season. So you're, you're at the mercy of nature. So people trying to get a sense of control over their lives so look to uh, gods. They look to spirits. They first look to nature and see what kind of spirits were in nature. But in the end, religion became a prime component of the way people thought in the agricultural age. So people focused on gods. And of course, religion, um, being what it is, uh, the ideas of religion became absolute for them. Absolute, uh, universal to people in uh, the society as well as being unquestioned. Unquestioned. So these came about through edicts laid down by religious leaders, pharaohs, kings, uh, popes and uh, generals, whoever was in uh, charge, because most societies were feudal societies during the agricultural age. And the job of an artist then was to interpret these conditions for us, these absolute principles and conditions, especially of, of religion. So this is a good example. Uh, the Sistine Chapel, Vatican City in Italy, uh, the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church for the last 2,000 years. And it's, I uh, know it's hard to see at that. It's probably easier to see on those other screens with better resolution. But uh, what you see there is a lot of representational art, pictures of people that the masses could see and understand. They could see and how they're positioned and what they're doing, that uh, how they represent religion in this case. So this was design, this was done by the famous artist Michelangelo about 500 years ago using fresco, that's wet paint applied directly to freshly applied wet plaster. Now, the artists and architects also looked to absolutes. They looked to find the best standards of beauty and aesthetics and of taste. And those standards that they came up with became the philosophy and the art movements of classicism. So under classicism, they took those standards and they developed um, examples that they could use and emulate and use those as precedents. So this church here at Santa Maria Novello, by the famous Renaissance architect Alberti, 550 years ago, is an important precedent because it, it's particularly well known for its proportions. Proportions being the relative sizes of elements in the composition. Now, Art and architecture then became to represent the values and aspirations of the civilizations through the agricultural age, typically being religious. So this is a good example here. This is the temple to Athena called the Parthenon in Athens, Greece, constructed about 2,500 years ago. And it shows the power of religion in that ancient Greek culture. This is the job of architecture and art, especially in the classical, in the agricultural age. So the Cham Towers of the Champa civilization here in Vietnam, anywhere from 500 to 1800 years ago, uh, also showed the power of religion in the civilization here in Vietnam. Angkor Wat in uh, Cambodia does the same, very powerful evocation of religion in all of these civilizations throughout the world. So worldwide, the architecture of the uh, agricultural age that remains for us to study is primarily religious. Burial mounds like the pyramids in Egypt, uh, temples, cathedrals, churches, mosques, synagogues, and towers, as you see here. So classicism became the philosophy of uh, the agricultural aid that guided the work of artists and architects. 
When they look back by the time of the Renaissance, 500 years ago in Europe, they look back to the ancient Greek and Romans to study again well, how they could be the precedents, the highest standards of aesthetic and beauty in the world. And the Pantheon here in Rome, constructed 2,000 years ago, became another prime precedent to be used for classical architecture around the world. So the U.S. Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. is directly based on this design of this pantheon in, in Rome. The only thing that's different are the words across the bottom of the pediment there. So there are lots of styles then that were developed under, the, under classicism in the uh, agricultural age, Gothic, Romanesque, Baroque, Rococo, Beaux-Arts, Neoclassical, and other period revival styles. Each of those different styles arose in, in uh, very specific geographical areas for specific cultures at specific periods of time during the agricultural age, but classicism itself is the overall philosophy and approach to art and architecture uh, that covers the entire agricultural age. Uh, and it expresses the, uh, the uh, spirit of the times, the spirit of the agricultural age, and therefore the same sense of reality, the same way of thinking, especially about art and architecture. So architecture in particular is dependent upon the materials and the technology available for construction. Um, there were a lot of wood structures we know during uh, the agricultural age, during the times of classicism, especially for residences, using wood. But wood decays uh, relatively rapidly over time, so very little of those kinds of structures remain. Uh, bronze, the Bronze Age was about 5,500 years ago, the Iron Age 3,000 years ago. Uh, they made a lot of tools and, and art, artifacts, uh, but they could not make shapes and sizes and quantities necessary for architecture. So stone and brick masonry became the materials of classicism. As shown here in the Gothic uh, Metz Cathedral, 500 years ago in, in Lorraine, France. So that technology of stone and uh, brick masonry needs to take the gravity loads of the building itself as well as whatever is imposed on the building, such as here in the Colosseum in Rome, uh, built 2,000 years ago. There are lots of people sitting in the amphitheater the other side of the wall there. So all of those loads have to be taken down to the ground so the building will stand up. Now masonry materials, stone and brick, only work in compression. So if you think of compression being the loads coming down a column, they're pressing each other in the column all the way down to the foundation and in the end it's the ground itself pressing up against the building, pressing down on it. So. The forces of gravity have to take natural paths through the brick and stone to make their way down to the ground. The natural path, if you're going to have openings, is normally through an arch. So it's the same thing. The loads of the building above come down to the keystone of the arch. Each, each uh, brick or stone in the arch takes that load down in compression on the each side of the opening. So most openings in classical structures are like this. They're arches. So piling up all of that brick and stone uh, makes the walls become very, very thick. Uh, so openings, therefore, must be very, very small. That leaves a lot of wall area that's available to be covered with ornamentation, either to express the meaning of the building or ornamentation that expresses all kinds of meaning to the, to the masses, to the people. This is the Ho Chi Minh City Municipal Theater, um, otherwise known as the Opera House. And as you can see, the walls are very thick. Now, under classicism, you never saw high-rise buildings because it was only so far, so high 
that you can pile up stone and brick until you get to a point where you don't have any space left on the ground floor. So four to five stories is about as much as you'll see. Most classical structures are two or three stories, uh, like the municipal theater here. So when you see today faux colonial buildings, high-rise buildings being built in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, you know, you kind of have to wonder, right? They're using, they're applying, they're tarting up a building with colonial ornamentation on a modern high-rise building. It's, it's, it's not honest because they do not represent the times today. Now, the basis for modernity, then, that became the Industrial Age, were the scientific re re revolutions at the beginning of the European Renaissance 500 years ago, four to 500 years ago. Uh, Copernicus is a prime example. Up until that time, um, the religious world of the Agricultural Age uh, looked at everything as revolving around the earth, the people, the earth, and the gods were at the center. And the moon and the stars and the sun all revolved around the earth. Copernicus showed that uh, it was the other way around. The moon revolves around the earth, the earth revolves around the sun, and there are other planets out there. And Galileo proved it when he invented the telescope and he, he found several moons uh, revolving around Jupiter. So that clinched the deal. As you can imagine, that upended the absolute values of the agricultural age. We know that today is the age of enlightenment, or the age of reason. And it became the basis for modernity, the condition of the world and civilization that we've been living in until now. So it brought extensive changes to the world economy and uh, to technology, uh, bringing individualism, capitalism and the market economy, urbanization and industrialization. It also brought with it a sense of progress, looking towards the future, moving towards the future, and therefore questioning tradition and the past. So this painting here by a French utopian architect, Tony Garnier, in 1904, uh, represents a city for 35,000 people. And you'll notice there's a hydroelectric dam up there at the top of the painting because this was a self-contained city. It had all the power it needed uh, to run the industries and, uh, and to provide power to all the houses and the commercial facilities. So this represents uh, at least his sense of what an industrial city ought to look like. And of course, they never built it, actually, but a lot of cities, industrial cities, this was the model for them. Now, the Industrial Age itself began, uh, based on those advances of science and philosophy, um, 250 years ago in Great Britain, when they first had the first powered machines that could power other machines to make products and factories. Uh, Great Britain was a good place for this because they had lots of coal and iron uh, ore, uh, minerals to make iron, and then uh, had lots of people, labor, Lots of energy, a lot of water power, water wheels uh, to run the mills, uh, a lot of money, capital, and then they had a good transportation infrastructure so they could get the iron and the coal to the, to the factories or the smelters, and then they could get the industrial products back out to the cities. So this painting here, represents the Industrial Age, uh, the painting by William Bell Scott in 1860. A lot of imagery here of the Industrial Age. So up at the top of the photograph there, you'll see a modern bridge, reinforced concrete structure, or perhaps steel, it's hard to say. A steel column, though, right in the middle at the top of the factory there, very slender, steel column. No more heavy masonry. And down in the lower right-hand corner, a drawing or an instruction manual printed, printing itself became an industrial process. And then down the lower left-hand corner, that little girl. I kind of wonder, <laughs> why is she there? This is a dangerous place. It's a factory. But she represents the tremendous growth of the middle class 
during the Industrial Age. So industrialization became ascendant for most of the population uh, through the Industrial Age. So modernity then is that set of scientific, philosophical and social and economic uh, conditions at least then uh, to that allowed both the industrial age to happen and then modernism. It made possible the industrial revolutions and then uh, modernism became the philosophy and the aesthetic aesthetic movements uh, that arose from the, those transformed conditions. So it led to a new reality, a new way of thinking in the world. The emphasis was on newness new industrial materials, new industrial products, new building types, train sheds. They didn't have trains before. Exhibition halls for industrial products. Uh, factories, of course, office buildings. So everything was new. And modernism expresses, therefore, the spirit of the times that's created by those new conditions. Now notice the huge gap in time. Here are the two gray bars between the beginning of modernity and the beginning of modernism. It takes philosophers and artists, meaning, uh, sculptors, painters, uh, musicians, and architects, a long time. Uh, to understand and interpret for us what these new conditions are. And it took that long uh, for, for real modernism to come to the world. But in the end, they looked beyond the representational paintings and sculptures of, the, uh, of classicism to abstract ideas. Because science and philosophy is all about abstract ideas now. And the emphasis, as in science, was on experimentation and newness. So the, the art that resulted uh, represents individualism and freedom, freedom in the arts, no longer tied to precedence of classicism. So this painting by Piet Mondrian in 1921 represents that complete change from representational art of classicism to modernism. Now architecture is constrained though by the strength of materials. In this building, uh, the uh, Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, the Florence Cathedral in Italy, began construction 700 years ago. It was designed 700 years ago. But it became a hinge point in architectural history between the agricultural age and the industrial age. But it took three or four or 500 years for that to become apparent to everybody, but nevertheless. We now, because of this building, understand a new reality and way of thinking. So as I mentioned before, classical buildings, the, the gravity loads have got to make their way through natural paths through the stone, generally through arches. Now when you look at the small domes around the base of the big dome, they're a hemisphere, which is nothing more than a series of arches going around in a circle. So the natural uh, path through a hemispherical dome just naturally goes down around and then down through the walls. But look at that uh, main dome. It's not a hemisphere. The, the cupola and the top of the dome is heavy. It's made out of stone. The dome itself, there's two layers of uh, brick, is also very, very heavy. Um, and somehow the forces should have made their way down through a natural path. But in this design, they could not. Uh, the architect was Arnolfo di Cambio. And he really shouldn't have thought of this because he didn't know how to build it. They started construction on the cathedral, and it took 100 years to get to the point where they needed to build the dome. But still, nobody knew how to do it. They knew that if they started piling up brick, it was going to collapse before they got too far. 
So Filippo Brunelleschi came up with a rather inelegant solution. Um, first of all, he, he figured out ways of interlocking the brick so they acted more as a unit across portions of the dome. Uh, but that's not enough. Then he came up with pieces of stone and iron and wood chains, chains around the uh, dome that allowed it to constrain the forces. So instead of the forces from the cupola coming on down and tending to pop out the dome, those chains constrained it. So for the first time in history, we bent the forces of gravity. They were no longer natural. So that ability to bend the forces of gravity became the primary principle of the modernism to come several hundred years later. And think about it, you know, if you can start bending gravity, you can start bending a lot of things in the world. So the, again, the absolutes of religion and the world and society started to crumble. What it meant is we're now, we could see that it become free to conceive of designs uh, that were otherwise inconceivable in classical times. Now, if you should not have been able to conceive of that solution, given the sense of reality in those days, and under modernity then, we now see that we could make that, people were making a big change. So our collective sense of reality changed and their new way of thinking. We call that a paradigm shift. Now, one way to understand a paradigm shift is to look at the psychological uh, concept of gestalt shift. So when you look at this image, you can see it two different ways. The image doesn't change, but your mind can see it in two different ways. So some of you are seeing this as an old lady. So how many people are seeing it as an old lady? Yeah, about half, which is about what psychologists would think would happen. Because the other half of you are seeing it as a young lady, right? Looking in a different direction. So you can see it either as an old lady or else as a young lady. And your mind, though, can switch back and forth. Once you figure it out, you can, you can do it. But with a paradigm shift, you can't. Once you've made that shift of reality, you can't go back. So modernity became, modernism became a completely new way of thinking about art and architecture. Well, by the mid-1800s, finally, they were able to make iron and then steel shortly thereafter in sizes and shapes and uh, quantities necessary for architecture. So before this building, before 1851, they were building factories using cast iron columns and wood timbers. Uh, the engineers were designing them, uh, but they weren't changing the architecture. They were still tarting them up with... Uh, with classical ornamentation. They, they weren't thinking about modernism. That changed with this building. Sir Joseph Paxton, a landscape architect and self-made engineer, designed this building for the Great uh, Exhibition of 1851 in London. He used um, cast iron columns and cast iron uh, trusses um, not much ornamentation, but most importantly, it uses the new industrial material of plate glass. So the overall effect of this building is stunningly modernist. There's a new building type, an exhibition hall. New materials, cast iron and uh, plate glass. And it changed the vocabulary of architecture. But it was not adopted by, by architects for another 50 years. The architects, at least in Great Britain, um, were reacting against the industrial age by that time. They were into romanticism. They continued eclecticism and architecture. Ar architects became irrelevant, really, in the world by that time. And uh, the architecture degraded further into eclecticism, Gothic revival villas. But the engineers kept working on the technology and the materials. 
So by the time that uh, Le Corbusier, the pioneer modernist architect, uh, built this little model, the shift of thinking into modernism because of the engineers had already occurred. So he illustrated here what it meant so that other architects could understand it. The forces of gravity are now bent substantially. So you look at this little model and then you wonder, hmm, I can understand the columns. The loads are going to go down the columns, but how does gravity take it to the uh, columns to go down? It goes horizontally. So imagine that. All the forces of gravity are now being brought horizontally across the floor slabs to the columns to make their way down to the foundations. You do that because reinforced concrete or steel decking with reinforced concrete poured into it has steel reinforcing bars in it that can take tension loads. So that's what you need to do if you're going to bend the forces of gravity. It has to be able to take tension. Otherwise, it pulls apart. And stone and brick, of course, you start pulling it apart and immediately collapses. Concrete will do the same unless it has the reinforcing bars. So there are no walls in this model because they don't mean anything anymore. They no longer are carrying gravity loads. So the walls can be anything. They can be anywhere on the model. So this is modernism. This is a rational approach to design that allows substantial freedom now in the design of forms and planning. And by this time, the engineers had figured out how to design frames for high-rise buildings. So by the, the middle of the 19th century, uh, they were using cast iron and then sh steel shortly thereafter. But this was the first building uh, to use a, a metal frame, high-rise building with a curtain wall. This is the Home Insurance Company building in Chicago, Illinois, United States, in 1885. It's designed by American architect William LeBaron Jenny. And it has a curtain wall. So you look at that wall, it's no longer carrying loads, so it's no longer as massive as it would have been otherwise. It would have been impossible under classicism. A uh, curtain wall means that the wall is hung from the frame, literally, like a curtain. Or it's sitting on the edge of the floor slab, and it's only spanning from floor to ceiling, uh, which is what it's doing in this building. So this is a modern building one of the first modern buildings in America. But it's not modernist yet, because it has ornamentation. You look down at the base of the building, it uses stone, there's arches and ornamentation. So couldn't quite make the complete break from classicism into modernism with this building. But with this building, they did. This is the Reliance Building. You know, also in Chicago. So Chicago became a center of modernist architecture in the world in the last part portion of the 19th century and then the early 20th century and still is a center of modernism today. Reliance Building designed by American architects Burnham and Root in 1894, so just nine years after the previous building, as a steel frame. And it's a modernist building that fully expresses its structure, uses very large openings, from column to column and from floor to ceiling, all glass. So with this, architects could see. They could realize this freedom of design with these new materials and new technology. So they no longer needed to rely upon the precedents and the historicist styles and the rules of the past. There's no ornamentation. There's just no need to be representative of something from the past. It was a new architecture that fit the new industrial age. So this is modernist architecture, a rational approach to design. No preconceived forms, very rational. It, it, you first look at information about the site itself, then you look at the neighborhood, you look at city planning as a whole, you look at climatic conditions. Under classicism, you take a precedent like the Pantheon and you plunk it down someplace. You don't need to consider all of those things that now we do consider. But most importantly, in these buildings, we consider the function of the building. Uh, 
Now, with the frames, the structural frames, the exterior walls, as I said, can be either hung or supported or they can be anywhere on the frame. So you're free to plan a building of any configuration, any form, required by its function. So the famous saying by American architect Lewis Sullivan in 1896, form ever follows function. So when you think about classicism, function followed form. Built the form first, it was a preordained form, then you stuff the functions into it. But now we look at the functions first and design a form to fit the functions. And then the enclosure of those forms can be any kind of waterproof material or assembly, including all glass, if the function requires that. Or you can use any kind of thin membrane, or you can use uh, louvers and screens, like many modernist buildings do here in Vietnam. So this is the Barcelona Pavilion. Uh, it was constructed as an entry pavilion into the International Exposition in Spain in 1929 by German architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. So it demonstrates this tremendous freedom in planning and design that became available, and also the diversity of forms that were also now becoming available and are seen around the world today. So classical buildings are usually symmetrical. I mean, the entryway is in the middle, and the rest of the building it'll spreads equally off to each side. Modernist buildings are usually asymmetrical, which means they're not symmetrical, because they're considering function. They're driven, so the main entrance is driven by the function, the analysis of the functions within the building and their interrelationships. So this is the Bauhaus, the famous design center in Germany between World War I and World War II. Um, this, this portion of the Bauhaus was in Dessa, Germany. This building was designed by Walter Gropius in 1926. So in addition to displaying the asymmetricality of the building, the students would enter on the end go up the stairways, and then onto each floor into these big studios. One floor for architecture, one floor for art, one floor for photography. Okay. You get the idea. The function demanded that the entry be on the end of the building. But in addition, it also displays the industrial materials of uh, steel and glass. Now, since the walls and partitions can be arranged anywhere, they can, they're independent of the structural frame, uh, you can have a lot of opportunities for interpenetration, both vertically and horizontally. So you can poke holes in the floor, make an atrium within your house or in a building. Uh, you can go anywhere horizontally. It also allows outdoor terraces and recreational areas. So this is the Lovell House, designed by American architect Richard Neutcher in 1929. And it shows uh, modernist buildings usually have primary characteristic, they usually have flat roofs or single slope roofs. In addition, they use cantilevers. Cantilevers, uh, this house doesn't exhibit any, but uh, cantilevers are a portion of floor area extending out beyond the structural frame, hanging out over space. A uh, very common characteristic of modernist buildings. So again, when you see these faux colonial buildings being built here in Ho Chi Minh City today, they often have cantilevers up there around the second floor. So you've got all this ornamentation coming down that look like columns in the end of the second floor. No apparent foundation, right? They're just dishonest. So instead of conveying the mass of a building, as in classicism, modernist buildings display volume instead of mass. They convey the lightness of the frames instead of the massive solidity. So this is the Glass Palace department store constructed in Heerlen, uh, the Netherlands, 
uh, by architect Fritz Puitz in 1935. And you know you could go to an architecture magazine today or look at Art Daily on the internet and you'll see new buildings today that look very similar, right? All glass buildings. You know, this is timeless. Now there were timeless buildings, of course, in classicism too. As classicists will always point out to you, the timelessness of classical architecture. No, this is it here. Timeless. So the structural frame being a grid doesn't mean you need to enclose it all. So here, the Corbusier, pioneer, modernist architecture, architect in 1931 with his architect cousin Pierre Generet designed the Villa Savoy in Poissy, France. So they didn't enclose the ground floor. They have some recreational uses there or utilitarian uses. Maybe they're parking a car. Uh, so the enclose, what, it, what it demonstrates is the, the enclosing enclosure can be anything of any form. So on the main floor, which is raised above the ground, they use these ribbon windows. And you'll notice they go right past the columns. So it's a true representation of a curtain wall. The walls are literally hung off the frame. Now, modernist buildings also express the honesty of the structure. Now, this is the Foreign Affairs Department. Um, it was designed in 1961 by Vietnamese architect Chun Van Tai, of course for the Saigon government, but now it's still the Foreign Affairs Department of the Ho Chi Minh City government. But all this uh, expression of structure, just a pure expression of structure, provides a great deal of interest in the composition. That, as you can see, substitutes for ornamentation. You don't need ornamentation. Because modernism is a complete break from the past. So here, French architect and engineer August Perret in 1903 built this apartment building in Paris. It was the first modernist building to use and exhibit its reinforced concrete frame. And that was unusual in 1903 because there's no applied ornamentation. So this is really the beginning of the Art Deco style where they use the uh, structure, complex articulation of the structure and the rhythm and the facade elements uh, to express everything that is needed about this building, the abstractness of modernism. So the, the structural frame usually expresses a regular rhythm. It doesn't have to, as you saw in the Villa Savoy, the villa a couple frames back, is just a smooth uh, skin. It doesn't really express regularity, but usually it does. Um, this is the Unité de Habitation. This is a city within a city in uh, Marseille, uh, France, designed by Le Corbusier in 1952. So here, the module of the units, these are two-story units, apartment units. Uh, so those modules, as well as expressing the structure, are very regular across the building. So the colors and the features of within the module itself, replicated across the building, provide a great deal of interest. So modernist buildings do not communicate uh, meaning. They don't evoke meanings. They're an abstraction, an abstraction of space, geometry, and light. So again, they're parts in an abstract composition. So the architects make intellectual, or artists in art, make intellectual design choices in forming these compositions. This is the Rietveld Schroeder House in Utrecht, the Netherlands designed by Gerrit Rietveld in 1924. Rietveld was a prime force in the De Stijl movement or the De Stijl movement of, of art, modern art in the 1920s. And again, when you look at this house, this villa, 
You could plunk it down in Ho Chi Minh City today and it would fit right in. It's timeless. And the modernist buildings also expressed express the honesty of and authentic nature of materials. Industrial materials are fabricated in factories and then brought out to the site and hung up on the perimeter. So less skill is needed of construction laborers on the site. Unlike classicism, where you've got artisans on the site chipping away at stone to make representational ornamentation. But we recognize that the industrial materials had qualities of design and beauty of their own. So modernist architecture represents this honest and authentic nature of materials. So this beautiful shop house at 187 uh, Nguyen Tai Bin Street in District 1 of Ho Chi Minh City illustrates this. And you look at this and you look at those two middle floors and you look at those sun blocking elements that we call Brie Soleil. Uh, and you think, wow, that kind of looks like a fence, doesn't it? Those must be wood slats. And sure enough, they are. You usually don't think of wood as being an industrial material, but here it definitely is. They cut all those pieces of wood to length. Perhaps they put them in panels in a factory and brought them out and hung them up in the frame. We don't know. Uh, but this is an example where wood slats is a beautiful industrial materials in this design. Uh, shows this uh, honest and authentic use of this material. Now, just as in classicism, there are many different styles under modernism. This is the Rusikov Workers' Club, designed by Russian architect Constant Konstantin Melnikov in 1928. You notice how all these, most of these projects come out of the 1920s? Must have been a very exciting time. We call this their style, they called it Russian constructivism because they like to take fragments of buildings like you see here and put them together in a unified form. So this was Russian constructivism. Other styles include Art Deco and Expressionism, Minimalism, Functionalism, Futurism, the International Style, and Vietnamese modernist architecture. Vietnamese modernist architecture is a very distinct style under modernism. So again, as in classicism, each of these styles represents geographical areas, specific cultures, specific points in time. But modernism as a whole expresses the spirit of the industrial age, the spirit of the times. Now, there are three major styles of modernism that are uh, easily misunderstood and that are often, I think, applied incorrectly to Vietnamese modernist architecture. This is postmodernism, one of the most widely used ambiguities in the world today. You know, it's uh, been defined through all disciplines of philosophy and science. And you go look at the uh, entry for mod postmodern in Wikipedia, and it is a mess. Nobody agrees anymore on what this word means. But in architecture, it's very specific. It looks to the past. 1966, American architect Robert Venturi wrote a book called Complexity and Contradiction. And he was reacting against uh, modernism, especially the international style, which we'll see here in a minute. Um, and the international style was definitely becoming decadent, bland, glass and metal high-rise boxes. So he advocated the use of historical references, looking to the past, bringing references into the building, ironic references, humorous or witty imagery or fragmentation, anything to break down you know, the form or the volume of the building. So this is Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans, built in 1978 by American architects Charles Moore and Perez architects. Um, Postmodernism in architecture, look to the past, period. Now the full colonial buildings here that you see in Ho Chi Minh City today are not postmodern. 
Because even though they're tarting up the high rise frame with colonial uh, ornamentation, they just don't have the spirit of architecture. They don't rise to the level of architecture. Now, uh, by the way, modernism is not dead yet because in 1960s and the 1970s and the 1980s and into the 90s, famous architectural historians were declaring modernism dead. Postmodernism was going to take over, but it died by the end of the 20th century. And modernism is still here today. So you look on the internet, especially on Art Daily, at the parade of buildings every day. They're still exquisitely modernist. Most of them are still modernist. And the winners of the International Design Awards are still stunningly modernist. Uh, so it's not dead yet, but in four weeks, in the third presentation, we'll talk about what might be taking over. Brutalism. Brutalism started with the words, French words, beton brut which means raw concrete. And of course, beton is a Vietnamese word too, which means reinforced concrete. So in brutalism, structural concrete, the walls and the frame were left unfinished. They take the forms off. You see all the form marks, rough concrete. And in some cases, they even put ribs into the forms and they poured the concrete, took the forms off and with the reverse image of the ribs is there, and they pounded them with tools to make them even rougher. So this technique, this style, was used for a lot of monumental public buildings. So it, it started to take on connotations, especially in the mind of the public, as being massive and overwhelming. So this is the Boston City Hall, constructed in 1968. Uh, three architectural design professors in the Boston area, Coleman, McKinnell and Knowles designed this building. This is my favorite building for decades. But Vietnamese buildings are not, they do not express raw concrete. They are made of reinforced concrete frames, but they're covered up with plaster. And the walls between the columns are brick, and they're covered up with plaster. So Vietnamese modernist buildings are fairly complex, a lot of elements. But they have a smooth finish. And Da Rua, uh, the exposed aggregate plaster, a little bit rough, but it doesn't communicate on the whole roughness. So Vietnamese modernist buildings are not brutalist. They express lightness and human scale. They're the exact opposite of brutalist. Now, global modernism all the different styles, and the international style are often confused as being the same, even by famous architectural historians. The international style sterilized the principles of modernist architecture too narrowly. Now, American architect Philip Johnson and uh, architectural historian Henry Hussle, Russell Hitchcock curated a large exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1931. And they wrote the book called International Style that went along with it. And what became the natural result out of defining modernism too narrowly was bland glass and metal high-rise boxes that you see all around the world today. And this is what most people that react against modernism are really reacting against. It's the blandness of the international style. So in this image here, you look at the building in the background there, the rounded building, and you'll recognize it as the Bank Texco Financial Center Tower, constructed in 2010, by, uh, designed by American architect Carlos Zapata of New York City. And uh, I actually like this building. I think it's one of the better international style buildings. But you can see it's, a, it's got a glass and metal skin that's very smooth. International style buildings have smooth skins. Now, the building in the middle, which is in addition to the National Treasury Building, the colonial building there on Nguyen Hue Boulevard, uh, was designed by Vietnamese architects uh, Nguyen Chung Lu and Ngo Dang Ban in 2007. And you'll notice that they added some vertical fins. It's, it's got a glass and metal curtain wall also, 
but they added other elements to the skin that gave it a lot of texture. And then they had insets into the form that presumably represent some ceremonial spaces behind there uh, that uh, make the form much lighter. So this building design follows the principles of Vietnamese modernist architecture set forth in the mid-century. Well, most buildings in the world today, though, are not modernist, even though they've been built here during the Industrial Age, uh, even though they're built in contemporary times. The modernist buildings were the interpretation of modernity in the Industrial Age, and they expressed the spirit of the times. But most people in the end have not really understood modernity or modernism, and they haven't accepted it. Even the majority of architects are not artists and use formulaic, functionalist solutions that really are not modernist. So you look at this house here, it's a typical vernacular residence in the United States, especially in the Midwest and the mountain states. In fact, this is my aunt's house in Montana. <laughs> but it's very functionalist. It has modern conveniences, but it's not modernist, anywhere close. It does not express the spirit of our times today. So you need to be careful because you see these words, modern architecture and modernist architecture used interchangeably. They're not the same. This is modern architecture, but it's definitely not modernist. Now, further advances of science, beginning uh, with Einstein and his theories of relativity early in the 20th century, are bringing us to a new age, the information age. Uh, these principles are not yet fully understood and defined, but we are beginning to discover a new architecture, a new art, but it is as yet unnamed. But in our third session on the 18th of November, uh, I'd like to cover what I think some of these conditions are and what direction we're going uh, with architecture, at least. And one of the central messages of that presentation will be that I think Vietnamese architects are leading the world today in information age architecture. This is the Chuan Chuan Kim Tu Kindergarten in District 2 of Ho Chi Minh City by architect Dam Vu of Yin Chup O Architects. This is an example. So in summary, the sciences and the philosophies of modernity reduced, sciences look to reducing everything in reality down to the smallest part possible, which in the industrial age was the atom. So the scientists realized they could take the at different atoms, put them together in different molecules, and make different ma new materials, which made new products. So it shouldn't be too surprising that modernist arts and architecture focused on taking parts and putting them together in a harmonious composition. And this is a masterpiece of modernist architecture. This is the Chandai Nia. Specialist High School it was originally known as the Colonial Institution, the Tabard School of Nguyen Yu Street, so that's the main entry. But this new addition was built along Haibachum Street in 1960 by Vietnamese architects Nguyen Kim Meng. So, as opposed to classicism, which used precedence and ornamentation, here you see a masterpiece that is uses parts in an abstract composition. So Vietnamese architects became masters of this, of abstract composition using areas of light and dark, ins and outs, solids and voids. So our next presentation on the 28th of October will focus on Southern Vietnam as a center, not the center, but a center of modernism in the world. So I look forward to having you all come back, if possible, for that. We'll focus strictly on Vietnamese modernist architecture and how it represents 
Vietnamese identity. So be happy to take your questions. Well, it's an architectural rendering. Well, oh. which is uh, obviously um, a colonial building, Corinthian column capitals, uh, pediments above the windows. Um, you see anything else? Uh, well, the cornices, yeah. I was an art history major in in college, so I'm. This is a very fascinating talk. So. One other question: How would you characterize the? I don't know how would you. Well, that's the question. How would you characterize the high-rise buildings that are being built in Ho Chi Minh City today? The ones that are replacing the French colonial buildings, apart well, from being ugly. Well, they're international style. They're bland, glass and metal buildings. Right? Okay. Uh, they're mostly designed by foreign architects, and they're not doing their best work here in Vietnam. And um, most of the developers, though, are Vietnamese. I don't think they're, they're not managing these foreign architects well. We're not getting good architecture out of them. Thank you. Good architecture in the city. Can you name three? Name three. Yes, please. Represent of, of modernist architecture. So that yes. means Vietnamese that, modernist that you architecture. you feel is uh, well, good architecture. You know, you, obviously honest. the obvious one is the Independence Palace. Uh, the second one would be the General Science Library. <laughs> well, let's see. The third one, I've got so many favorites that uh, it's hard to say. I mean, the uh, building I showed here, the Chun Dai in Hia High School, is really my favorite very abstract, simple composition. It expresses modernism anywhere in the world. And you also said that architects are not necessarily artists. So it's still me. So which, um, which building would be a representation of an, an architect who is also an artist in your art? Well, the three buildings that I mentioned already, but because those architects, um, as we'll talk next week, the Vietnamese architects came from two schools, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Hanoi and the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. They were primarily art schools to start with. So those graduates knew not only architecture, but art. And they were artists. That was part of their spirit and their building show that spirit. And even among modernist architecture all over the world, uh, architects are artists. Unfortunately, so too many architects just became functionalists. It's building bland buildings that fit functions for people, cheap buildings. Back there. Um, hi. First, uh, thanks for your lecture. I'm really looking forward to part two and three. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, any preservation efforts in the city in terms of, um, you know, identifying really key historical modernist structures and making sure that they survive the development that's happening. Um, just curious if you've had any conversations, uh, you know, with, with the government about what structures are historically important or if you see any effort at all to, to see them preserved. I've, notice a lot of structures get knocked down and it's quite sad to see them go. Um, it's really, they, these buildings never come back. So yeah, we just, you. we just lost one on, on Win Van Choi street. That's right. Yeah. About a month ago. I noticed it. Uh, in, uh, in our book about Vietnamese modern architecture, 150 projects, uh, just over the, since the building was published, four or five buildings have already been demolished and, Many of them that were photographed by Alexander Gorel, he was he was in the building while they were tearing it down, as he's recording it. So this, the value of this book to me has always been as a record of this tremendous accomplishment of the Vietnamese people in the mid-century. Uh, but in answer to your question about historic preservation efforts here, you know the 
the building down here behind uh, the city hall. Um, Tom, you remember what they call that building? Yeah, it was the it was the old the, the old uh, French colonial government administrative building, and I keep forgetting the Vietnamese name for it, but uh, a beautiful building on uh, Li Du Cham and uh, Dom Quay streets. You know. Okay. Yellow. Okay. No, 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 no. Not, I know what you're talking about there, but not that one. Li Du Cham and Dom Quay. Okay. Well, anyway, I think you get a sense of the location of the building. That building has been saved by citizen participation activism. Okay. And that started with Facebook and groups like the uh, Saigon Then and Now group or the Saigon Heritage Observatory group, which are now primarily all Vietnamese. And that was the intent when those groups were set up. Uh, for Vietnamese to start becoming more aware of the need for activism in saving historic structures. And that building was saved by a partition drive. Mm -hmm. So far it's been saved. Um, now the Vietnamese Modernist Architecture Group um, uh, is trying to do the same for modernist structures, but there's a long way to go. And I, I, I've had discussions with government architects about this. It's been hard for them, too, because until you list what's valuable, until you list the good buildings, it's, you can't, it's hard to save them because they get torn down before they realize they're gone, right? So finally, the government's come up. It took many, many years, but they've got a list now of villas in District 3, colonial villas, that can now be saved. And they've promised me now that we're going to start looking for modernist villas around the city, so that's how we'll start. Villas and moving on to larger structures. All right, so the young man's question was about traditional Vietnamese architecture and where does preservation of uh, traditional architecture stand now? And he mentioned the imperial palace in Hue. Uh, yes, that's right. right in Hue. Um, um, I'm not sure. Uh, there's an expert on this named Tim Dolling, who has uh, been very instrumental in setting up the Facebook groups and written several books. Uh, about architecture around Vietnam, and he just finished writing one for Hue and Da Nang and, and Hoi An, and that's out there for sale that I recommend you buy. But uh, So I'm not sure of the answer specifically to your question. The problem with historic preservation in general is finding experts that know how to properly save them without destroying them or without ruining their looks or without losing their historical value. That's the biggest issue in historic preservation. Um, for me, I got, um, thank you for your fascinating presentation. So for me, it's a very specific question. Uh, would you care to elaborate the brilliant ideas behind Trang Dai Nghia School? Like you say that the abstract there is phenomenal and because it's my high school, and I will be walking past there to observe the brilliant ideas very soon after this presentation. So mm -hmm. would you care to elaborate on that? Sure, a little bit. You know, when you, when you look at this, you look at a lot of parts. So you look at the Brie Soleil, the vertical fins, which are white against the dark background, that right away set up that contrast between light and dark. And this is pretty much the north east uh, facade, I believe. So it's not really there to block the sun. It's really there, you know, in, in, in modernist, in modernism, you know, we say buildings do not have ornamentation. We don't have, we don't decorate modernist buildings. But, you know, in Vietnam here, they did. This is decoration. Um, but there are parts used in this abstract uh, composition. Uh, so this, the areas of light and dark are very important in setting up 
abstractness. Abstraction being uh, abstraction of geometry, volumes, and light, especially light. And then, um, because the floors come out away from the classrooms beyond, leaving an exterior courtyard, it's a wonderful mitigation of climate, uh, keeping the sun away from the classroom so they don't heat up uh, during the day. But that, that articulation of form, bringing the structure out, that articulation, um, instead of being a bland single skin, you got a double skin, a double layer of skin here. It's an important part of this particular composition. So there you go, light and dark, solids and voids, does that answer your question? Huh. Right here. Question? Yeah. Uh, my name is Erika. I'm from University of Architecture, Hotel City. I would like to ask one question about the Dolanya High School because I was a student there too. Um, I would like to ask how do you think about repainting the old building like that? Because when I was stud when I studied there from 2008 to 2015, the whole building is still in uh, was still gray. Uh, actually, um, modernism architecture appeared to me as a uh, as a uh, on about gray or white building, but when they re repainted them in yellow, I feel like um, the the building lost uh, a part of identity, a part of a feature of modernism. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Um, I think that um, I didn't realize it had been repainted. I'll have to go look at some of my old photographs from 2005, 2006 to see if I can see what it might have looked at before. This is a common issue in historic preservation. Uh, in America, a lot of my own experience as an architect in America was in historic preservation, adapting old buildings, historical buildings for new uses. Uh, so we'd have scientists go out to take paint chips and look down through every layer of paint to find what the original intent of paint was and try to rep and repaint it so it's in the original historical intent. Now, Vietnamese art, modernist architecture like this is all based on, as I will talk about next week, what they learned from Vietnamese traditional architecture. When you look at Vietnamese traditional architecture, especially in the South, they're very restrained. They use earth tones. They use natural colors. They're not gaudy like buildings up in the north, or especially in China. Uh, so here, buildings are very restrained. So most of the Vietnamese modernist buildings from the mid-century are gray plaster, or maybe use the brown tones of Da Rua, the exposed aggregate plaster, right? So when they paint them, you know, you're destroying historic value. You're, restoring, you're destroying, in, in a case like this, Vietnamese identity. Because the, the people, the Vietnamese people themselves, who really brought modernism about in Vietnam, because they had this memory of the traditional architecture. They didn't need the new buildings to look exactly like it, but it brought memories from the architecture. When you repaint it in a colonial color, yeah, then that's a different identity. Does that help? Okay, a question from Facebook. Well, hey. <laughs> You're reaching out. No, this is a really good question, and it fits right in. The question is, some say the gray color of Vietnamese modernist architecture is boring. What do you think? Well, I think I pretty well answered that by saying that it has historical meaning in Vietnamese identity because of the earth tones, the natural colors of natural materials in Vietnamese traditional architecture, especially the dins, the community halls, uh, not so much in pagodas, but uh, in the community halls. Um, so again, modernism expresses the natural and authentic nature of materials. Uh, so you put the plaster up on the wall, it's gray. 
but since that fit with what the Vietnamese architects, not me, but the Vietnamese architects understood as Vietnamese identity, that's what it should be, and that's what it was. And therefore, most of the buildings of the mid-century are gray plaster. I look at all these buildings as a whole, and they're all so beautiful and exquisite. Um, that grayness is part of that beauty. It's part of the abstract composition. So it's not boring to me. Any other questions from Facebook back there? That was a good question. I appreciate it. Okay. Let me get the young man behind you first, and then I'll always let you be last one there. Hello, mister. So um, most of the building you showed before, I think uh, it's come mainly from the southern Vietnam, right? Right. So um, did you think that when you talk about the Vietnamese uh, modernism, you talk about the southern Vietnam rather than the whole Vietnam? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, um, when I when I travel to to um, Hanoi and uh, the southern Vietnam as a whole, I think it's quite different from from the culture, the climate, and anything about the architecture. Like Ngo Bic Thu is quite the the uh, the person that come from southern Vietnam and mm -hmm. Saigon, and you think that they the different between um, two reason uh, of southern and uh, northern Vietnam. I'm, I didn't understand the last part of your question. Say okay. again. Um, the the different uh, in the um, separated region of the southern and the uh, northern Vietnam in the modernism architecture. You're asking, is there a difference? Do I think there's a yep. difference? Yep. Yeah, there's definitely a difference yes. because they're, you know, due to the events of history, um, northern Vietnam and southern Vietnam developed on different, uh, at the same time, they, they developed in different ways for good reasons. Uh, we, I think we pretty much all know about uh, this history. So uh, they were busy up there. They were much busier than the Southerners were at prosecuting the war, as they needed to be. So most of their architects were, de were developing uh, military facilities uh, to keep their war effort going. The Americans were bombing Hanoi and Haiphong and Tan Hua. But here, um, when I was here, I was shocked to arrive here and we're building new hotels. They're building high-rise office buildings, villas all over the place, housing everywhere. I was, I was shocked at all the construction, not military construction, that was going on here. It was an amazing place. So, yes, it became very different because the two countries were, were developing in different directions. Okay. Your turn. Hmm. You're on. I'm still a little confused about the, between modern, modernist, and modernism. Are modernist and modernism synonymous? Well, I'm not going to be able to flip all the way back through to find the words, but they're all they're all different because it starts with modernity. Those are the social and economic conditions, right? Which oh, led, to, well, yeah, the industrial revolution, the scientific revolutions first, then the industrial revolutions that set up the conditions of modernity under which we live. Modernism followed as the philosophy and art movements, the aesthetic movements, right? And then modern, we had to differentiate between buildings within modern, in modernity that weren't modernist, simply because they don't adhere to the philosophy, right? So what does that leave? One more word. Uh, well, modernist itself, right? So modernist became the, the styles of architecture that fit under modernism, which fit under modernity. Well set. Back there again in the corner. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, so uh, 
in in the north, uh, in uh, the post-war era, there were also a lot of uh, uh, extra constructions, uh, hospitals, universities, schools, etc. And most of them are influenced by Soviet architecture. And so, does the Soviet architecture contribute to Vietnamese modernism, or does it not? Yeah, sure it does. Um, you know, a lot of people, though, when they when they talk about Soviet architecture, people, especially non-architects, immediately get in their mind that it's Stalinist. It's some heavy, oppressive kind of architecture, and that's not true. The Russian architects that came to the north in the 1970s, primarily, that's when they had a big economic uh, uh, program from the from the Soviet Union to northern Vietnam. Um, they were really following the architecture of Russian constructivism, which I showed as one of the examples of modernist architecture here. So it isn't too surprising that the buildings that they built, like the Friendship Center and the Polytechnical University, beautiful examples of modernist architecture in the world that start with their style of modern of constructivism, um, but were really Vietnamese. There's a there's a good book called uh, it's a book about Hanoi uh, by uh, I'm an old man, so I don't forget I don't remember things very well anymore. Logan, uh, remember that book? Yeah, it, it, sorry, but it's a really it's a it's about the history of Hanoi the architectural and planning history of Hanoi. And uh, what, what he talks about is how the Russian architects worked with the Vietnamese. Now, the Vietnamese, these were gifts from the USSR, these buildings, the design and the building construction, they were gifts. So you can't, can't say, oh, you know, we don't like your gift, right? You have to work with them. And that's what they did. The Vietnamese architects worked with the Russian architects to soften things down, you know, uh, very successfully. So those buildings aren't just Russian, they're, they're also Vietnamese. Last question, you got it. And uh, the color one. Okay. Yeah, it just seems like I, I can't seem to find it. Um, Amazon America? Yes. I just looked yesterday. It's, it's you saw it? Yeah. Oh, okay, because I, I couldn't find it. Yeah, let me let me clarify that for yeah. you. Uh, he's asking about the international version of this book. Now, this is the Vietnam version. It's in English. It's not Vietnamese, but it's the Vietnam version, published by Tayoi Publishers in Hanoi. This is black and white. This is the international version is a completely different format. It's a square, eight and a half by eight and a half by square, in color. In color, it's a very expensive book. Um, it's the same words, same photographs, but it's in color, and it's a different format. It looks different. Um, yeah, I looked yesterday. It's, it's it's there. Yeah, but it's also in Amazon Singapore, Amazon Australia, Amazon UK, Amazon Germany. It's everywhere. Um, a good source is a book depository of England. Um, for some reason, uh, it's easier to get a book into this country through England than it is through America. It took me months to get a copy of my own book here. Um, yeah, the color copy here. Can I do what? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, um, you can buy books. You know where the old Compass Cafe is on Pasteur Street, close to Le Loy. They have Miss um, Jung has a stock of books there uh, for sale. But uh, I'm not a businessman. <laughs> I don't want to pay taxes. So I don't sell books. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the old Compass Cafe is on Pasteur Street, 63 or 67, 63 Pasteur Street. It's, it's on the third floor up in an alley, a little bit hard to find. But it's a kind of a place where uh, a lot of creative people hang out. So Michael does, uh, Tom, myself, uh, 
a lot of Vietnamese creative people like Na and now also Nana. She goes to her. Yeah. No, only black and white. Yeah, that, that, there's it's such a problem trying to get books into Vietnam that that's why we published it separately in Vietnam, so it was readily available in uh, Vietnam. Unfortunately, the publisher insisted on uh, publishing it in black and white, but sold a lot more books as a result. It's a trade-off. Okay, thank you very much to the American Center. And I uh, hope to see you all again uh, in a couple of weeks on the 28th of October. Thank you very much.